get to turn around and see you. Any veterans, if you would stand, I want to personally thank you. Or just stay seated, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you anyway. <laughs> so thank you for your service. It's greatly appreciated. There, a thanks from me is not enough, but thank you anyway. So. Uh, we're continuing our Gods at War series that we started a few weeks ago. We're in week four uh, of six. And just like I always do, just in case you weren't here for any of them, I always like to give a little bit of a recap. Uh, we started out just with a, an introductory sermon, just the, the idea of what God's at War is all about. The idea that there are things in this world that are warring for our souls, that are trying to take the place of the one true God in our life. And if we don't, if we're not real careful about it, it's easy to let those other things of this world get in the way. We said that our God is a jealous God. In fact, in Exodus 20, he tells us that himself, that he is a jealous God. And when we put things in place of him, when we let other things get in front of him, he doesn't like it. Then we followed that up talking about the gods of pleasure and how pleasure is a good thing. Most of the things that give us pleasure start off as good things until... We let them take the place of God and we start worshiping the gift instead of the giver himself. Then last week we talked about the gods of love and how in our society today we have the wrong idea about love, that love's going to complete us, but only God can do that. And this week I want to start by asking a question, one that I want you to think about. And that's this, what is your idea of success? Or better than that, what does the world tell us it takes to be successful? I've heard a, a lot, and I almost did this as, a, as an example this morning, but you hear the term dressed for success. I almost put a suit on this morning. That's just not me, though, so, so sorry, but... But you hear the term dress for success. Uh, I know in a lot of my uh, secular jobs, especially in training classes, they would tell you to dress for the job that you want, not the job you have. In other words, I was at a, at working at a call center one time, and, and they told me that in, in training classes, we didn't really have a dress code for the floor when you were on the, on the phones. But if you wanted to work your way up to a supervisor position to go ahead and start dressing like the supervisor's dressed. In other words, dress for the job that you want, not the job that you have. Actually, there's a funny little picture that, that's on social media a lot. It says, dress for the job that you want, not the job you have, but now here I am in HR dressed like Batman, and I may not have a job anymore. <laughs> I couldn't find a picture to actually put up, but you get the idea. Here's the thing, though. In my experience, success is a relative term, isn't it? What could be successful for one person or one group could be a failure for somebody else. When we were in New Mexico, we had some friends that, that lived about an hour away from us in Roswell. And uh, Tim and Denise were in ministry there, and they had a couple of teenage sons at the time that played uh, eight-man football. I was actually familiar with eight-man football before we moved here. Uh, but they played eight-man football for Gateway Christian Academy in Roswell. And they were one of the best teams in the state. Uh, we would go up and, and watch them play every once in a while. Uh, and last season, they went undefeated and made it to the state championship game and got beat on their home field for the state championship. In fact, they lost to the same team that beat them the year before in the state finals undefeated for the whole year, and you lose one game, I would call that a success. But I talked to some of those boys after that game, and they didn't feel very successful. In fact, let, let me put it this way. The, that team that they got beat by is, is on a level where Shattuck is playing them next season in a regular season game. So they're, they're on the level of Shattuck if you're familiar with them. Tennessee football. Most of you know I'm a big Tennessee fan. Tennessee's been down for a few years. 
In fact, the previous coach had run our recruiting into the ground so bad that when Butch Jones was hired five years ago, we were begging for a 6-6 six and six season and just to make a bowl game. That would be a success for a Tennessee fan five years ago. But the past three years, they've been calling for Butch Jones' job because he hasn't won an SEC championship yet. Success is relative. Kentucky basketball. If you know anything about Kentucky basketball or their fans, if you don't make the Final Four, it's not a successful season. Some years they say if you don't win the national title, you can go undefeated and lose in the national finals, and it's not a successful season. Any baseball fans in the building? What's a successful hitter in baseball? A 300 average, right? But that means you're getting out 7 out of 10 times and you're considered a success. And it even affects us here in the church sometimes. Church leaders and and preachers, we get wrapped up in the idea that the more and more people that are coming, the more successful the church is. But that's not always the case. One thing that I do know is that for the most part, we want to be successful. All of us want to be successful. I don't know of anybody that sets out wanting to fail. At least I hope I don't know anybody that wants to fail. But what does that mean for each of us? What does it mean to be successful? The world says to make as much money as you can and to make more and more money, to climb that corporate ladder by any means necessary, no matter how many people you have to stab in the back. To get the applause of men, to care what other people think of you, and and to get their approval. Kelly and I were at a concert this weekend in Tulsa. Uh, It was the Air One Positive Hits Tour, a bunch of different Christian artists together. Uh, And I love going to Christian shows. And they ask for applause, but they always try to point those applause to God. Last year, for the first time, I got to see Trans-Siberian Orchestra in concert. Great show, absolutely love it. But I couldn't tell you how many times the artists from Trans-Siberian Orchestra were trying to get applause for themselves. It's a complete different idea behind the shows. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to those shows. I love them, and in fact, we're going to be trying to go in December when they're in, in Oklahoma City. But there's a difference between what a Christian artist sees as a success and a secular artist sees as a success. The world also says that being a success is becoming secure. Having enough money saved up, put aside, that no matter what happens in your life, you never have to worry about it. You're secure in your finances no matter what happens. You don't have to ever worry. The world's idea of success often has to do with just that, that making more and more and more money. In other words, sometimes being greedy. Our story that we're going to look at this morning from Luke 18 shows a man and his greed. So if you want to look at it in your own Bible, Luke 18, 18 through 30, it will be on the screen as well. We know this story as the rich young ruler or the rich ruler, the rich in the kingdom of God is the, uh, the heading in my Bible today. But it says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. So you notice Jesus doesn't even begin answering his question right off. He says, Why do you call me good? God's the only one that's good. He poses that question right from the beginning. Picking up in 20, he says, You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Ten commandments. At least most of the ten commandments there. And I can just see this guy that's talking to Jesus just kind of puffing his chest out at this point because his answer says, all these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. Just that pride, yes, I, I'm doing exactly what you're telling me to do. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. 
When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Does that equate on the human level? You become sad because you're wealthy? Just keep that in mind as we, we go through the rest of this. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said to him, We have, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Now before we go any further, I just want to say that this story is not just about money. Okay, It's not. It's not telling every one of us to go out and sell every possession that we have. It's just not doing that. It's a story about idolatry. Jesus put himself in direct competition with the very thing that this man loved the most. Some of us, it might be money. But Jesus is basically, he's setting himself here, and he's setting the man's great wealth here. And he's saying, okay, choose. Choose who you're going to serve. It's either going to be me or your money. Which one are you going to serve? That's what he's asking this man. And Jesus said much the same thing in, in Matthew 6, 24. He says when, when he said this, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and def despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Money in and of itself is amoral, though. It's neither good nor bad. It's just money. But it's how we view it. It's how important we put it. How much importance that we put upon it that can cause problems. Did you know that in the Gospels, Jesus talked more about money and money issues than anything else? It's often portrayed as God's main competition. And the reason is because so many people expect money to do for them what only God can do. So let me give you a few lies that the God of success and the God of money, I'm using those interchangeably this morning, that the God of money tries to tell us. And they're the very things that God wants to do for us. The first is this, that money will satisfy you. If we only had enough money, if we only had more money, then everything will be right in my life. We'd be satisfied and happy. John D. Rockefeller, who, was, who founded the Standard Oil Company, or Corporation, sorry, and was one of the wealthiest men in world history, he was asked, what would it take to make a man happy? And his answer was one more dollar. But Rockefeller himself, while extremely rich, he understood that money didn't bring true happiness or satisfaction. He actually taught a Sunday school class, and once he said to his students, it is wrong to assume that men of immense wealth are always happy. He also said, I know of nothing more despicable and pathetic than a man who devotes all the hours of the waking day to the making of money for money's sake. Money won't satisfy us because no matter how much money we have, we always want more. Another lie that the God of money tells us is that money means you matter tells us that we're significant, that we're important. 
And when people believe that lie, they will judge their worth by how much their bank account is worth. Instead of looking to God for their true value, they look to the God of money, thinking that the more money they have, the more important they are. Another lie that that money tells us is that money will make you secure. And I kind of mentioned that as, as one of the things that the world tells us is successful. But think about it. Isn't the quite opposite the truth in that? Because the more money you have, sometimes the more insecure you become because you're afraid you're going to lose that money. That somebody's going to steal it. Or if you've got it all wrapped up in the stock market, that it's going to crash and the economy's going to turn and then you've lost everything. The thing is, what we put our security in usually ends up being our God. It reveals what we put our hope in. And that's why a lot of times people with big money don't think they need God. They think they can take care of themselves. Actually, I've heard of a missionary to a third world country once tell a church that was trying to support him to not send money and goods to the the people of that third world country, to the poor nationals, because he wanted them to trust in God. And he said if rich Americans sent them everything they needed, then they wouldn't trust God because they would trust the Americans sending them things. The last lie that the God of money tells us is that money will save you. You see, the real problem with idolatry, whether it be success, money, or any of the other idols that we look at in this series, is that we look to something other than Jesus to save us. That is really what it boils down to. We're lonely, so we look to a relationship to save us. Or we're empty, so we look to our possessions. We're depressed, so we look to food for salvation. Or we're rejected, so we turn to pornography. We're angry, so we look to alcohol. We're apathetic, so we look to our work. We're proud, so we look to status. Or we're worried, so we look to money to save us. But none of these things, none of these things will give us what we're really looking for. I want you to notice that the four things that some people think money will do for them are the very things that God wants to do for all of us. God wants to satisfy us. And in fact, He is the only thing that can truly satisfy. God wants to make us significant because we're significant because we're made in His image. And He created us. That's why we're significant. God wants to make us secure in Him and in His salvation. And He wants to save us. That's the entire reason that He sent Jesus to this earth. And that was His plan all along. But that's what idolatry does. It puts other things in God's place. But money can't do for us what only God can. Millard Fuller was a a millionaire by the age of 29 years old. He bought his wife everything she ever wanted, and he lived a life of pleasure. But One day he came home and he found a note from his wife that said she had left him. Millard went after her and he found her in a New York City hotel room. And they talked into the wee hours of the morning as she poured out her heart to him. She made him see that all the things and all the money had only left her cold. Her heart was empty. She felt dead inside. So Millard and his wife, they got on their knees next to the bed in that hotel room. And they decided together to sell everything they had and to dedicate themselves to serving the poor. The next day was a Sunday, and they found a church near their hotel. They worshipped, they thanked God for their decision. 
and for their new beginning. And after the service was over, they shared with the minister what they had decided to do. The minister told him what they were doing was very radical and really not necessary. Millard said the minister, this minister told us that it, was necessary, it wasn't necessary to give up everything. He just didn't understand that we weren't giving up money and the things that money could buy. We were giving up ourselves. We were turning ourselves over to the Lord. So Millard and his wife, Linda, stuck to their decision. They went on to start an organization that I'm guessing most of us in this room at least have heard the name, if not more familiar with it. It started Habitat for Humanity. As I think about the story of the rich young ruler, I often wonder if he became a rich old ruler. As I said earlier, it it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to read what we see that he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. That just doesn't click for us a lot of times. But the thing is, having a lot of money is not something that most people would be sad about. This guy was sad because he understood what Jesus was saying to him. That you can't serve both God and money. You've got to choose And he didn't want to choose. He didn't want to cast aside the idol of money. So he went away very sad. Now I am not arguing that it's wrong to have money. That is not my goal this morning. Actually, if you think about it, all of us in this room are extremely wealthy compared to 95% of the world. It's not wrong to have money or to have wealth as long as that wealth isn't what is most important to us and it doesn't take the place of God in our lives. Millard Fuller is a man that chose to let go of worldly success and money, but he's not the first to ever do it. And he won't be the last either. Actually, we see that example in the New Testament. I love what it says in Hebrews 10 about some of the early Christians. It says they were being persecuted and publicly insulted and were suffering at the hands of their enemies. But in verse 34 of Hebrews 10, it says, You joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Those early Christians had their houses, their property, and possibly their money completely taken away from them by the authorities. But they joyfully accepted that because they knew those things are not what really matters. They knew they had a better and lasting possessions. They had spiritual possessions, a heavenly reward, a home with the Father. Being honest, I don't know how I would take getting all my property taken, confiscated. My home, my possessions, my money, I don't know that I would be too joyful about that. I'm guessing most of us in this room probably wouldn't be real joyful about that. But those early Christians, they held on to their money and their possessions very loosely because they hadn't turned them into idols. Do you know how natives in the jungle, how they trap monkeys? Has anybody heard that? They put a piece of fruit in a cage that has a hole big enough for the monkey to stick his paw in, but not big enough for a clenched fist holding a piece of fruit to get out of it. So when the monkey sticks his paw into the cage, he grabs the fruit, but he can't get out and he's trapped. All he has to do is let go of the fruit. And he'd be free, but he's too greedy to open his fist and let go. If you're holding on to money too tightly, if it has become an idol that has taken the place of God, then open your hand, let go. Focus on the better and lasting possessions that we have in God. 
There's an old hymn, and we're going to sing it for our hymn of invitation here in just a few minutes. It's, I'd rather have Jesus. The first verse says, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. And I'd rather be led by His nail-pierced hand. But have you ever heard the story of how that song came about? It's actually a really, really awesome story. A 28-year-old lady named Ray Miller wrote this song. And her father was an alcoholic, wanted nothing to do with the church, but through his family praying and witnessing to him, he threw away the idol of alcohol and he put the Lord first in his life. And his daughter Ray wrote this song after hearing him say that he'd rather have Jesus than all the gold and silver in the world and all the houses in the land that money could buy. So she penned the words to the song at that point. But no music had been put to it. Seventeen years later, a woman named Bev Shea put the words of the song on the family piano, hoping that her son George would see them as he sat down to play the piano and thereby changed the course of his life. Because he had goals in his life that would not have pleased God, and his mother was doing everything she could to try to redirect the course of his life. And it worked. When George read the words to the song, he put them to his own music. And it wasn't long before George Beverly Shea was singing this song in churches everywhere across America. And then, as a song leader for years with the Billy Graham Crusades. I pray that the words of this song will redirect your life. If needed. That you too would honestly say that you'd rather have Jesus than anything that this world affords. And if you wish to accept God this morning through belief, repentance, confession... And baptism, we offer you that chance as we do every week. If you need prayer to let go of the gods of success, if you need to hear these words this morning, then be encouraged to remove the God of money from your life because we can only serve one master. And that master needs to be God. If you would just stand and sing with us as we sing, I'd rather have Jesus, number 506, we'll sing the first and second verse.